Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first for a while uh, of, uh, of events for Skylark. Uh, my name is Alex George. Uh, I'm the owner of Skylark and I'm joined today by Danny Kane, who's the owner of the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas, and Kerry, uh, who is um, also in the shop. She's upstairs uh, in the nonfiction section. I am downstairs, appropriately enough, in the children's section, which is where I'm usually relegated to in these things. And uh, we, are, we are thrilled to be here, and we're thrilled to welcome Danny uh, for the second time to, 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 to Skylark to talk. And um, Carrie and I first met Danny at a bookseller convention. I think it was in Memphis before we'd even decided we were still trying to work out if we were actually going to uh, open Skylark. Uh, and he's uh, always been hugely supportive of our efforts uh, and, and a good friend. Uh, he's a wonderful poet. And as I said, he came to Skylark, I think it was in 2019, yep. uh, to read from his collection, Continental Breakfast. Uh, and since then, he has published another collection of poetry called El Dorado Freddy's. And putting the rest of us to shame, on May the 4th, uh, another collection is coming out, Flavor Town, which I'm really, really looking forward to because uh, I just, I, I love his work. But today, we are not here to talk about that. We are talk, here to talk about his Twitter feed that became a newsletter, that became a zine, that became a book. Uh, now, through the Ravens Twitter feed, which you should all follow, by the way, uh, Danny began to explain why uh, Amazon is such a threat, not just to independent bookstores, but to actually pretty much everybody. Um, and this became so popular that he collected all of those thoughts and put them into this zine, how to resist Amazon and why, which went on to sell, well, at least 10,000 copies, right? Last um, I heard it was 30. 30? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, well, um, that goodness me! All right, so through that, so uh, anyway, that became so popular that it turned into this book, um, and so that is that is why we're here. And his advocacy against Amazon has resulted just recently um, in a profile in some little-known regional magazine. Um, what was it? Oh, the New Yorker. That's right. Uh, uh, which <laughs> which was pretty amazing. Anyway, he's an inspiration to uh, to all of us, particularly I think to independent booksellers. Um, and, uh, and, and a good friend, and uh, we're thrilled to welcome him back to Skylark to, to talk about his new book. Uh, he's also, just sort of parenthetically, in case he wasn't busy enough, the brains behind the uh, Paper Plains Literary Festival, uh, which just had their big event last night with Hanif Adurakib and Eve Ewing. So yeah, he's a, he's a busy, busy guy. So Danny, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be back. Yeah, it's great to see you. Great to have you here. So first of all, I've got to ask, tell, tell us about last night, because my head nearly blew off when I saw who you had, who you had coming. Oh, it was amazing. Um, you, like uh, Unbound, we've had to go fully online this year. Um, and, you know, I think for this year, I knew Hanif had the book Little Devil in America coming out. It's like, no matter how, what we're doing for um, Paper Planes, I want him to headline. And it was um, it was inspirational. It was wonderful. He's one of the best performers of any writer there is. It, to see him read his spellbinding, whether it's online or in person. And he and Eve are such good friends and share such a deep love for each other and the subjects they write about that the whole evening was wonderful and inspiring. It made me kind of recalibrate, like even why I do writing. Like it just made me rethink the creative process. They were so great. Um, and it was huge. We had a huge turnout. We had more oh, than 800 sure. people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which it, it was just thrilling. And it's so great to know that there are that many people who want to see a great writer on a Wednesday night. Um, no kidding. So, yeah, we because yeah. we saw him um, at Winter Institute. Was that yep. in Baltimore? And, and he I think won. that was the Albuquerque one. Oh, it was Albuquerque. And just yeah. incredible presence. Uh, just and and just, I mean, I will read anything that man writes. Yeah. He's 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 incredible. So he yeah, simultaneously that... makes me want to keep writing and just to give up because I'll never get to this point. <laughs> yep, 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 for sure. Yeah, I've I've got a copy of uh, Little Devils in America on my shelf at home, but I ha I haven't cracked it open yet. But um, I'm I'm anxious to do so. So anyway, well, anyway, that's all great. And congratulations for that. That sounds absolutely Thank amazing. You. So let's 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 talk about Amazon. I mean, one of the things about Amazon 
is that it's as we'll we'll talk about, I guess, is that it's so huge. Um, and for more than three years, I have been trying in my own little way to articulate and encapsulate all the nefarious things about this this company. But it does so much that it's difficult to sort of describe them all and get all your thoughts in a row. Uh, which is why this book was so brilliant for me, because it does the job for me. Uh, and it sort of, um, it puts all of this together in easily digestible, well, perhaps not easily digestible, because some of it's fairly hard to digest because it's pretty toxic. Uh, but it's, um, it was such a brilliant way of, of everything in one place. Um, and you begin this book as, I kind of think, it seems to me that you kind of began this whole journey uh, with a letter, an open letter that you wrote uh, in October of 2019 to Jeff Bezos. And I wonder whether we might start with you reading reading that letter for us all. Sure. Um, dear Jeff, last Wednesday, a customer bought a stack of books from us. Right before he left, he asked me, what parts of your business are affected by Amazon? I blurted out every part. I had never articulated this before, but it's true. I know I'm not alone in saying this and not just among bookstores either. Your business has an unfair impact on every retail small business in America. I'm writing to you to try to illustrate just how many people your business affects in a negative way. Let's start with books because that's where we overlap and books are my bread and butter. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it certainly seems like the book part of your business is modeled like this sell books at a loss to hook people into prime subscriptions, Kindles, Alexas, and other higher margin products. While this strategy has worked really well for you, it's totally disrupted everything about the book business, making a low margins, low margins business even tighter. Most dismayingly to us, your book business has devalued the book itself. People expect hardcovers to be 15 bucks and paperbacks to be under 10. Those margins are a nightmare for our bottom line, of course, but they also cheapen the idea of the capital B book. There's already enough happening to cheapen the idea of truth, research, and careful storytelling. We're dismayed to see the world's biggest book retailer reflecting that frightening cultural shift by devaluing books. This isn't just about business competition to us. We wish it were. We like business competition. We think it's healthy. But the way you've set things up makes it impossible to compete with you. Often the tech and e-commerce world brags about disrupting old ways of doing things with new, sleeker, more efficient tricks. But we refuse to be a quaint old way of doing things and we are not ripe for disruption. We're not relics, we're community engines. We create free programming. We donate gift certificates to charity silent auctions. We partner with libraries and arts organizations. That stuff might seem small to someone aiming to colonize outer space, but to us and our community, it's huge. Our booksellers are farmers, authors, activists, artists, board members, city council representatives. For so many places, the loss of an indie bookstore would mean the loss of a community force. If your retail experiment disrupts us into extinction, you're not threatening quaint old ways of doing things. You're threatening communities. When I taught high school English, we did a business letter unit. Part of what I taught was to make sure every business letter has some kind of request so it's not a waste of time or paper. So what's a request from you? Some of my peers want to break your company up. Some of them want to nationalize it. Some of them want it wiped off the earth. I see where they're all coming from, but I don't think that's what I'm after today. I could also request you stop profiting off of ICE's violence, stop enabling counterfeit merchandise, stop fostering a last mile shipping system that causes injury and death, stop gentrifying our cities, stop contributing to the police state with your doorbell cameras, stop driving your warehouse workers to exhaustion or injury, uh, a recent addition, stop union busting, or so many other things. Perhaps I could just request an explanation of why this chaos and violence is apparently so essential to your strategy. Or maybe I could request a leveling of the playing field. Small business owners are led to believe that if their idea is good enough, they can grow their business and create more jobs. Yet your company is so big, so disruptive, and so dominant that it severely skewed the ability for us to do that. I think a big part of leveling the playing field would mean fair pricing on your part. For our part, we try to level things by being really good at what we do and really loud. So we use our platform to try and teach people what's at stake as your company increases its influence and market share. I think it's starting to work. I get the feeling that we're seeing chips in Amazon's armor. Whenever we share stuff like this, it seems to resonate with our audience. Maybe someday you'll hear what we have to say. Maybe we can talk about it. 
over pie and coffee at Ladybird Diner across the street. My treat. I'd love to show you around a vibrant community anchored by small businesses here in Kansas, here on earth. Maybe it'll help you realize that some things don't need to be disrupted. Sincerely, Danny Kane. Such a good letter. I'm sure teacher Danny would have been very proud of that. <laughs> you know, that actually, that really was the start of the, the journey. I mean, we, we had a couple of Twitter threads go viral and it made me realize that people were paying attention. And so I became really careful and more uh, driven in what I was saying online about Amazon. But it, I quickly realized I needed a thesis statement. Like it's the English teacher thing. It's like, what am I actually arguing for? Uh, I, it, I knew it required more nuance than just like Amazon sucks, indie bookstores are good. That's too basic of an argument. So I, I wrote that letter as a manifesto, as a thesis statement. And then my friend, Suzanne DiGitano, who runs Max Packs in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, sent me a text and was like, you should make that into a broadside so I can sell it to my customers. And like mm -hmm. that turned into the zine, um, mm -hmm. which I, you know, I just, I really loved her idea of opening that conversation to customers and, and making something cheap and small and easily duplicated that we could, you know, spread across the country. And, you know, two years later, here we are. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's so great and so inspiring. And, and one of the beautiful things about it is how you capture so succinctly the, the glory. I'm mean, obviously we're all a little biased here, but the glory of independent bookstores and the value that we bring to communities. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, I'm sure, even if it's just in contradistinction to <laughs> everything else. But um, I just wanted to just to talk about books uh, to begin with. And there's, there's, a, there's so much to unpack here, but can you explain a little bit to people who don't know the history why uh, Jeff Bezos decided to begin with books? I mean, now, of course, it's the everything store. And again, we'll talk about that. But he began focusing specifically on books. And can you can you can you talk a little bit about what the business rationale behind that was? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. And it's it's a, a pretty clear window into how he views mm -hmm. what he does. And so um, he, he didn't pick books out of a love for literature or out of a desire to help people access books cheaply. He picked books because uh, they're easy to ship. They're small and rectangular uh, and they have cheap postage. He picked them because they're cataloged. I mean, every book has an ISBN number. So like everything um, was already organized and cataloged for him. And he picked them because it was something that would be easy for him to stock more of than the biggest store. And so he looks at Barnes and Noble and like Barnes and Noble has 150,000 books in there. I could have a million books and they're easy to organize. Uh, it's the same thing that's in Barnes and Noble. I can just have more and ship them cheaper. So it's pure commodity from day one. It's, it's, not, it's not about books at all. It's just about finding a commodity that he could easily scale up. And he's, he's repeated that pattern um, over and over again. Uh, but, you know, books were first. And in, in so I think the book industry is kind of, since he's been disrupting the book industry the longest, it's where we need to look to see the end game of Amazon's strategy because right. we're the furthest along. But I, but I wanted you to tell that story because I wanted people to understand, as you said, you know, very specifically, it was nothing to do with the love of books. Yeah. It was a purely commercial decision. And that <laughs> the absence of love of books, um, I think manifests itself or has manifested itself in other ways. Um, over the last several years. And I, I, can, I'd like, like to talk a little bit, if you would, about, uh, well, so first of all, so Amazon sells is roughly, am I right in thinking, about half of every, of all books sold yep. sold by Amazon, which gives it an enormous, you know, insanely unfair bargaining advantage. Yeah. Um, and what it means is that no publisher uh, none, of, none of the sort of big, big publishers is able to not do business right. with Amazon. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the the effect that that has had and Amazon's ability to so not just tilt the playing field, but tear it up? Yeah, uh, Amazon can do whatever it wants. It's not only is it 50% of, uh, of book sales, it's more than 75% of online book sales. They're on the online market. They're you know, their stranglehold is even tighter. Um, and it really, they have all the bargaining power. No publisher is going to work too hard to anger the person, the people who sell half of their books. And so Amazon can get away with whatever they want. They can, uh, they can 
negotiate terms and, and better prices. Um, and the publishers know this. And, and many of many, many people in the big publishing New York book world are frustrated by this, but they feel like they can't do anything. Um, there's, as far as I know, there's only one publisher of size in the United States that has actually and publicly said, we're not going to do business with Amazon. And that's Microcosm Press, the people who put out How to Resist Yay! Amazon and why. And so that was why, I mean, I immediately knew they were a, a great fit uh, for, for the project when they reached out about the zine. Um, but they made a point of saying, um, we're canceling our Amazon account. If Amazon sells our books, they're going to get them through a third party or a wholesaler. Um, we're, we're tired of being bullied by them and we don't agree with how they do business. So we're going to do our own distribution. Um, and it worked for them. Their sales have been up every year since they made that decision. Um, they're growing. They just opened a second warehouse last year um, in Cleveland. So they've got a great, um, a great thing going. But they're, I mean, they come squarely out of the punk scene. Like they're, they are <laughs> anarchist punk zinesters from the beginning. And that's the kind of spirit you need to, to take this stand. And it would be much, much harder for a bigger established, a place like uh, Penguin or, yeah. or Simon and Schuster to, to say this. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's frustrating. Um, big publishers have tried um, and they lose. Hachette had a really public spat with Amazon. Um, I think it was 10 years ago in 2011, I believe. Um, and and Hachette decided they were. I think it was bar, they were negotiating ebook pricing. It was, it was ebook, yeah. And um, Hachette decided to dig their heels in, and then Amazon took the pre-order button off of all forthcoming Hachette titles and bumped Hachette books to the second page of search results. And once you're on the second page, no one's ever going to find you. Um, and it got to the point where there were there were dozens of authors like signing letters pleading Amazon to to back off. Um, they were saying careers were being cut off before they could start because if your debut novel can't be pre-ordered on Amazon. So it was a mess. And, um, you know, they, they worked out their dispute, but that's some pretty serious damage to Hachette. And also just the idea of negotiating with Amazon at all, because the perception was that no matter how hard you play, Amazon's willing to play harder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was, I mean, I, I remember when it went down, I think Stephen Colbert actually did a a piece on it and then he chose a book um to sort of promote and it was um yeah it was i mean but it was punitive um and it was bullying and again yeah. it just reinforces the fact that amazon does not give two hoots about books yeah um, amazon only really cares about amazon uh, and and am I right in thinking? I think I am. You wrote a thing on on Lit Hub, and didn't that happen to you too? Didn't, after it you, might have. Yeah. To <laughs> the New York Times, they took your they took your buy button off. Yeah. Well, I mean, my buy button, the buy button on the zine disappeared suspiciously close to when I was quoted critically in the New York Times. I'm I'm not. I don't know. It's really hard to like prove any of this stuff. Um, both right. Joe Beal at Microcosm and the New York Times reporter were probably were like, yeah, they're probably uh, punishing you for this. Um, but th the point is not whether or not I was punished by Amazon. The point is the buy button can disappear and they don't, and nobody knows why. Um, and that's when 50% uh, of a book sales can go through that buy button. That's a huge amount of power over the story of an individual book. No kidding, no kidding. Oof, goodness <laughs> me. Well, um, so um, so your 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 book is is divided up into these various sections, and I wanted to talk about um, one of them in particular. Well, we're, we're going to talk about all of them in turn, but the the fulfillment pipeline, um, which is uh, there was. A, I remember seeing a piece. I think it was on the front page of the Times about the number of people who had been killed by. Um, Amazon drivers, or at least people wearing Amazon uniforms, uh, who were um, desperately trying to fulfill quotas or whatever it was. Can you talk a little bit specifically about the last mile? Yeah. Um, and, and, and what that means and why it's so important and why the, uh, the Amazon Prime next day delivery thing has sort of changed everything? Yeah. Well, the so one of the most popular things about Amazon and one of the things that makes it, it, it outside of book people, one of the tr best most trusted companies in the world mm -hmm. is their ability 
to, to ship, to get things very cheap to you very quickly. It, no company in the history of ever has been able to do free two day shipping or even free one day shipping. It's, it's a logistical feat. Um, and it was previously viewed as impossible. And so how come Amazon can do it? Well, Amazon has no problem pushing their workers um, to, to desperate, often injury inducing lengths. And so the, the warehouse conditions and the driving conditions that are required to get you that whatever, that toilet paper that fast, um, you are putting workers in danger. Like that's just, it's bleak, but that's how it goes. Like those conditions are required to ship things that fast. Um, and the reason why USPS or UPS can't ship things that fast is because those are unionized jobs and they mm -hmm. have contracts negotiated to keep those workers safe and healthy. Uh, and Amazon has no interest in any of that. Uh, but last mile, the last mile shipping is one way they've done it. So Amazon relies on existing shipping infrastructure to get to distribution points. And then once it gets to distribution points, those gray prime vans you see everywhere line up, uh, load up with 300 deliveries per day and, and go out on these grueling um, 11 or 12 hour routes. Um, often as low as like two minutes per stop, even in a place like Columbia or Lawrence um, where things are a little bit farther apart. Uh, and those vans, and the people driving them are not Amazon employees. They're third-party contractors. Um, and that's a loophole that Amazon loves. So they can absolve themselves of any responsibility. So if, if someone watches <laughs> their dog or their grandma get hit by an Amazon van, both of which have happened, mm -hmm. um, Amazon can say, well, it, you can't sue us because that's not our employee. That's a third-party contractor. You can sue this company. Um, but the thing is, I mean, obviously the people are wearing Amazon shirts, the vans say Amazon on the outside. Often they're, those companies are founded with loans from Amazon and their only client is Amazon, but they keep them at arm's length uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to kind of scoot away from that liability. And another is when Amazon, when it comes up with um, Amazon, like these drivers can't go to the bathroom. People have been talking about Amazon drivers going to the bathroom in water bottles. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon can still say our employees get bathroom breaks because they're talking about people who aren't driving the vans because they don't consider them employees or our employees get health insurance and $15 an hour when they start. They're not talking about the third party contractors and the temps who do so much of the warehouse work and the driving. Um, so it's just a way to squeak by without responsibility. But I mean, to eliminate that, you eliminate two day shipping um, and that's how they hook people. Um, once you, you create good working conditions in warehouses and delivery vans, your shipping speed slows down. And that's why shipping has taken longer than that for most of history, uh, because places like USPS do a lot more to protect their workers than, than Amazon does. Right. Well, all three of us during the pandemic, I know when we, when our doors were closed, um, and we couldn't even do curbside pickup, we all packed our cars full of books at the yeah. end of the day and drove around our various cities delivering but i mean the <laughs> the idea of doing one every two minutes yeah <laughs> i mean we did <laughs> our, our routes our routes peaked at 25 per route um and that took about two and a half hours yeah, and it was hours exhausting and hours, and hours yeah i was so tired at the end and that was like you know i didn't I didn't have a, a ticking clock. I didn't have a, a security camera watching my every move. I didn't have like AI detecting my eye motions and reporting to my boss if I yawned. And I could certainly go to the bathroom whenever I want. So like even under uh, better working conditions that that's really grueling work. And when, you, when, when people are expecting stuff to be shipped for free and fast, it's often the people paying the cost is the workers. Right, right. Well, let's talk about the, wor the workers because there was news today. Um, I don't know what to make of it. The um, people have probably been reading about that there is there has been a, a drive in Bessemer, Alabama, the the warehouse there to to unionize, and the idea was and the hope was that this was going to be the first, and there would be dominoes and they would topple. Um, and the vote was not even close. It was a two to one against unionization. Um, and I know that the pro-union fact um, um, uh, people are saying that 
there was uh, misinformation and there are various dirty tricks. But I've also heard on the other side, people going, look, they pay double the minimum wage. It's not that bad. And I was just curious what your thoughts were when, mm -hmm. you, when you read about that today and, and what your reaction was. Well, I, yeah, I, I, the, when I'm looking at the labor reporters and the people on the ground who I trust most about, because there's so much kind of sensational information about this. And, and there have been a couple of misfires. Um, like there was, at one point there was a boycott that someone organized that then the workers themselves were like, we never asked for this. And you probably shouldn't boycott while we're doing a union drive because it'll make it easier for Amazon to say that we're bad for business if we unionize. Uh, so from what I've heard, I, I think there's, I, I'm not quite sure it's over. Um, last I checked, they weren't sure how many um, contested ballots there were. And they said that Amazon was contesting ballots a lot. They were trying to gum up the works as much as they could with this vote. So it's possible they they challenged many ballots and all of those were yes. Um, or what, did I miss, have I not caught up? No, I'm just thinking, just contesting ballots. Where on earth have I heard that recently? Oh, right, no, and it's, it's exactly, <laughs> we've seen this play out in the South in another type of voting. Like it's, it's, the, it's the same playbook, right. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, I think there's there are court challenges. I think the labor board has a good case that Amazon was disrupting this this drive. Will it reverse the um, the the results of the election? It might not, but it might shape future union drives. Um, they might be able to correct some of Amazon's behavior. Is that opt perhaps too optimistic? Maybe, but like I need to find some sort of optimism in this to yeah. to believe that that all of us collectively can do something about Amazon. I do think the fact that this union got so far and, and got so much attention is a miracle. Um, these are, these are um, low wage workers, um, predominantly people of color uh, in the South, um, a, a very conservative anti-labor area uh, who made tremendous progress and got a lot of attention for, for raising a stink about working conditions at the world's biggest employer. Uh, and there's no way people aren't seeing that and, and being inspired at Amazon and, and across the board. Um, so I, I do think we're seeing a, a little bit of a tide turning in, in American labor rights. I think it would have been accelerated had the vote gone differently, but I can't help but think there are people who are inspired uh, and people who will keep fighting. Um, right. And like they're just the resources that Amazon put into to busting up this union are tremendous. Um, they're, um, like the, the labor relations board told them explicitly not to put a post office box outside of the warehouse. And they did anyway. Uh, and they got, they, they were leaked emails from the post office that were like, Amazon's really bugging us to put up this collection box. We got to do it. Even though Amazon was under specific instructions not to do that because it seemed like they would be tampering with ballots that way. Uh, so they think they're above the law and I think we'll learn more about what happened in there, um, as the court battle drags out. Um, but for people who say Amazon um, pays well, like that's that's their defense. They say we we pay well and we have um, we have benefits. We have health benefits from day one. But I think a really compelling counter argument to that is if Amazon warehouse work pays double the minimum wage, it's you're also twice as likely to be injured at work as you are in any other warehouse job. Um, and so that's that's incredibly dangerous work. And the turnover is very, very high. Um, and it, there, it's just a brutal job. And I, I think there's a lot more to say about the health of a job than purely what it pays. I think it's important to pay workers a lot, um, but it's also important to make an effort to keep them safe at work and, and make sure that uh, they're not physically and emotionally damaged by doing the job you want them to do. Right, because, because what they do in the warehouse, if I've understood correctly, is, I mean, it, obviously it's not driving a, driving a van, but, but they are under such pressure to 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 get all of these various things and yeah. package them all up and there and there are like that the there are breaks but it takes 15 minutes to get to a place and so you don't actually have any time to have a break and and so there's still it's a different kind of oppression yeah. but it is still just like using people just as cogs yeah well um, they have a their scanner gun so they they get instructions from their little gun uh and it's like go pick this item and put it in this bin but like embedded in that is a gps that tracks their location and so their bosses are getting data about where they are and how long each task is taking them and they get punished if they don't make that day's rate 
uh, which is the amount of work they're expected to do in the day. And the rate is based on like the top 20% of workers. So 20, two out of 10 workers can actually manage that rate, but most, a vast majority of the workers are trying to keep up with a pace they can't match. Um, and, and being in the weeds for that long has profound physical and psychological effects. Question, for sure. Have you seen Nomadland? No. Okay, you should watch it. And watch yeah, it. I keep hearing good things. Yeah, Francis McDormand in a in an Amazon warehouse. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's quite it's quite the thing. Yeah, Oof. yeah, and and the, and you tell I think a story in your book about somebody who was you know uh, before this this union effort who was just trying to set you know basically go hello so we're all getting hurt here, uh, and he was was he I think he was sacked. Is that right? And yeah, just no, it was Christian Smalls. It was a fascinating right. story. He was. Um, he was arguing about um, coronavirus protections. Like they weren't doing masks or social distancing or temperature checks uh, a month into the pandemic. And, and he staged a walkout and they fired him. And then there was a leaked memo. Um, he was a young black man. And there was a, a leaked memo where like high, a meeting where Jeff Bezos was present. Amazon's corporate counsel was like, we need to make this guy the scapegoat of the entire labor movement. Uh, and we need to portray him as not articulate, which is that's just like a racist dog whistle right there at the highest possible level of Amazon. The yeah. CEO is in this meeting talking about a single uh, warehouse worker of color. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's out there. You should, he's a good Twitter follow, too. He's he's still advocating and organizing um, and, and people see that stuff and pay attention. And they don't forget it. Yeah. Good for him. Well, so um, moving on. Because <laughs> it's not enough just to screw over your work. <laughs> um, so one of the other really charming things that um, I learned from reading your book, I, learned, I thought I knew a lot until I sort of started reading it. And I, I keep thought, hearing oh, that. Good grief. Uh, was the, um, the kind of, so the, um, I'm trying to think of the, the right metaphor, but it's, I don't know whether it's a, shark eating its young or something but 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 can you can you talk a little bit about the um uh, because because i think there's there's a misconception that uh, all amazon does is sell stuff um but that you know the, the but the revenue that it gets from selling stuff to people is i mean it's actually a huge amount of what they do but it's nowhere near all of it right um, so could you could you talk a little bit about the amazon marketplace and how amazon well, first of all, the, how, how vendors work in Amazon, A, and then B, get on to sort of how Amazon treats its vendors. Yeah, yeah. this is it's an important question. Um, and uh, Amazon makes far more money off of the third party marketplace than it does off of traditional retail sales. And I also think this is the part that leaves them most vulnerable to, to government action. And if you look at what the government is looking at and thinking about doing, it's, this is kind of the entry point. Mm -hmm. So Amazon Marketplace, they say it's a home for small businesses. And they say any small business can sign up and create a storefront on Amazon and sell their stuff. Um, so it's a platform, it's an e-commerce platform. It's like eBay or Etsy. Um, okay, cool. Amazon, the average fee on this transaction that that seller pays Amazon is 30%. I don't know about, <laughs> I don't know what the finances are like at Skylark Bookshop, but if we had to pay 30% of our cut of, of any of our stuff, we would be closed within weeks. Um, right, Gary, what do you think? We could probably. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and that's, that's, they do that with, uh, they get those fees higher and they're like, well, you can sell your stuff and do your own fulfillment or, um, you, we, you can do fulfilled by Amazon and you get prime shipping and it's faster and we'll send it from our warehouses. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're keeping more of the sale and they're also like erasing all of the brand identity of that business. Mm -hmm. Like they want the customer to have an Amazon transaction, regardless of who mm -hmm. technically the business owner is like everything about that transaction still says Amazon to the, and it's can be really hard to tell when you're on Amazon, when you click that buy button, where it's technically coming from or who's getting that sale. Um, so that's, I mean, even on the marketplace, they're really exploiting those, those vendors. But on the marketplace itself, Amazon is also selling products. So they're, uh, they're both the other team and the ref. Um, so like if it's, the, if it's the Yankees versus the Dodgers and oh the Dodgers oh, are also cool. all the umps <laughs> and the Dodgers are also kind of inventing new rules as the game goes. Um, 
And that's that's profoundly anti-competitive behavior, and it's illegal. And Amazon has been caught stealing ideas from third-party sellers to make their own store brand uh, merchandise. Um, and that, and that was one of the really, I mean, there are staggering moments all the way through this book, but this idea that Amazon is looking at what its vendors are doing, and when it sees a good idea, it just goes, oh, yeah, we can do that. Well, uh, and yeah, that's, I mean, when we say Amazon makes, I like, you hear it a lot that Amazon is most interested in data. And this is a real clear example of why data is the most valuable to them. Because to, to run the platform and to compete on that platform, they can see all the behind the scenes stuff about what products are selling where, and then they can use that data for their own, for their own purposes. And that's, and they, they do that on the third party seller level. They also do that on the customer level because they can track what you click on on the site and what you say to your Alexa and, and um, uh, you know, whatever else on your app or what you watch on Prime. And they use this to build a, a really complete portrait of you as a consumer that then they can really efficiently target you and, and sell you more stuff. It's called the flywheel. And that's, um, they want you to get stuck and caught on a flywheel. And that's not, that's not a term that was applied from the outside in. That's a term that Amazon came up with themselves. Oh, seriously? <laughs> yeah, is, is the flywheel. Uh, and, and so I don't know. We, like, it's, I, I hate to hold up independent bookstores as kind of the saintly counter example, but we think, we like think of customer loyalty and, and friends and, and welcoming and community. And Amazon is like, how can we extract enough data with this person to make them literally obsessed with our company. Yeah, and there's there's a line that you, that you 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 said which really sort of struck me when you said well, we are not the customers, we are the product. Yeah, uh, which was chilling uh, when 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 I read it. That that really really sort of struck home. So something else about the um, the everything store idea with all the vendors is that, um, and you, you talk about this a little bit how little Amazon cares um, actually about what is sold on the site. Yeah. Um, and you, you tell a fairly awful story about it. I think it was a defective motorcycle helmet. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? And then also about some of the, um, the sort of breaches of, 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 I don't know if it's technically a breach of copyright, but sort of the, the forgeries and bad, just bad stuff that's out there that yeah. they sell. Yeah, well, a, a guy bought a motorcycle helmet from Amazon, with, falsely believing it was certified uh, and safe, and he he died, uh, and his family sued Amazon, and and guess what they said? They were like, well, actually, that's a third party vendor, so you can't sue us because it's not mm -hmm. our product, even though it was purchased on Amazon.com and arrived from an Amazon van, um, you know. But that's that's a refrain by this point. Uh, but it's you know. Um, they're really struggling with the idea of the everything store because there's a lot of really dangerous stuff and, there, and there's forgeries and there's, there's um, like dangerous anti-vax books or, or Nazi books. And Amazon is really struggling to, to figure out where they're at um, because it's, it's becoming clear to them that they can't, they can no longer be the everything store. That's not what people want. But then how do you, how do you lock it down? Especially when so much of your, your, what the money you make is based on third party sellers. It's they're playing whack-a-mole very poorly uh, with, with counterfeit um, merchandise and, and dangerous things that have been outlawed and just like straight up like book theft, uh, people making pirated versions of other books. Yep. Um, and like just as a book person, people are you look for a book in good condition or you look for a specific edition. Uh, that's nearly impossible on Amazon. Like you might get an arc, you might get the British paperback. Uh, you, you know, might get a, a <laughs> you might get a print on demand um, that someone made a bad PDF and just ran it mm -hmm. through Kindle Direct and it doesn't even have the right cover on it. Right. Um, and, and you just again, like everything else, you take what's happening with books and you apply it everywhere else. Um, and, and so it's really hard to know you're getting exactly what you're ordering from Amazon. Um, and um, that can be annoying. It can be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, Oof. and and you did you know, uh, just, and just to circle back around to to these sort of not technically probably abusive, but the the massively unfair terms that Amazon imposes on its vendors. That again, there's a line in the book: the majority of small businesses who decide to go and sell their wares on Amazon don't survive. They they yeah. don't last more than a couple of years. Right, uh, which should 
tell everybody <laughs> everything yeah. they need to know about about how that's going. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm talking so much, Carrie. Did you have anything you wanted to, as usual? Alex doesn't let anyone else get a word in. I, I have a couple couple things I wanted to talk about. One is Dana. I know you're you're younger. <laughs> I very distinctly remember the dawning of Amazon. I was working in an independent bookstore at the time. And though it takes, you know, a year or more for things to occur to us here in Missouri when they've happened elsewhere, um, it was still pretty quick that it was apparent it was gonna be a problem. What did you think about Amazon before you were in this business? Yeah. I, well, I didn't think about it much. And, and you know, it's with all the attention, it almost feels like a confession. But like I when I was in college, I ordered books off of Amazon because they were cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in part, I think in recent years, people have been gotten a lot better at telling this story. Um, and and that's that, that's a lot of people. That's not just the Raven and that's not just me. Um, there's been so much good reporting and writing about uh, what's going on and the dangers of big tech monopolies that I just don't think people were talking about then and the, the novelty of it. I think Jeff Bezos from the get-go knew exactly what he was doing. Like this is exactly going according to his plan, but it took a lot of us a, a long time to catch up uh, and realize exactly what he wanted to do. Um, and with, I, I, I know it's reflected in the Raven story, like in the nineties, um, like Amazon started in 1997, right? Is 94. That the, 94. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was, it was kind of slowly picking up, but like mm -hmm. we were right across the street from us is the borders. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we were in the, in the bookstore world, the big concern was the chains and the, their discounts and, and why Barnes and Noble is getting books at better prices than independent mm -hmm. bookstores and how we could survive as borders and Barnes and Noble are, are exploding. And that was a red, it ended up being a red herring because um, the chains collapsed under their own weight. Uh, and then in the ashes, there was Amazon and like, where did they come from? But they're much scarier and much more dangerous. Um, so I think, um, you know, there was, they were kind of developing in the background as, as book people were really worried about the, the big chains. Yeah, we, we watch these major impacts on the industry. Um, and I just remember sitting there um, with the other people in the bookstore and we're like, what, what problems are being caused by what, <laughs> what things that are happening right now? Cause they were all happening at once. Um, yeah. It was, it was just a, you know, a vomiting well, and of, like, of I, and industry also, issues. It takes a brain like Jeff Bezos to look at where Amazon was and then to get to where they are today. Like I, it's just so impossible to, to imagine. I don't think any of us like this kind of cute startup that's selling books online and shipping them. Um, <laughs> there's, in, unless you have the most twisted capitalist mind, there's no way you extrapolate what was eventually going to happen. And that has so little to do with what we want to do. We want to quietly sell books and build a community and, and create a, a welcoming space for people who love books. Um, it, it, like we don't want to colonize the moon. And so we, we don't think like people who want to colonize the moon. Right. Um, Right. So yeah. it's like I, think I understand that brings why up people a are whole another issue, Danny, that um, how we as independent booksellers versus Amazon deal with returns and damages and waste is that ours go out to the community. And I don't remember if you talk about how they handle their returns and things. Do I don't, you mention I don't, that in your book? I don't get to, but I'm curious to hear what you know. Uh, my understanding from a conversation earlier today is that the Amazon owns entire dump sites, that they don't return the items to market. They just, it, it comes back and it just goes into this automatic yeah. dump. Yeah, I believe it. Well, it's because they're, they're not thinking of that about that as stuff that people might need or stuff that can be reused. It's just, again, it's a commodity and the cheapest thing for them is to throw it away because to reprocess yeah. and repackage would be, um, but yeah, I mean, we gave away seven books to our, uh, our homeless shelter last week. Um, yeah. and, and those are damaged books and, and those are arcs and, um, yeah, we do what we, we really do what we can to, to keep that stuff circulating. Yeah, of course. 
Well, there are a couple of other topics I want to talk about. I'm just looking at the time. If anybody has any questions or comments, please do um, either stick them in the chat or in the Q&A. I see we, we do have one question that we will, will uh, and one comment that will, will, will come to later. Well, I just met, so Anne has said, out of curiosity, I did a quick search of Danny's book at Amazon and it says temporarily out of stock. So <laughs> there you go. Again, that's the the uh, the nitty gritty of microcosm is that Amazon is really slow to restock their titles because uh, right. if Ingram is out, Amazon is most likely out too. Right. Um, right. They're always playing catch up. Right. But I think microcosm well, would be happy with that. Yeah, and I think Ingram might be out at the minute. So uh, if you want to buy a copy, um, we got them in the shop. So you're gonna have to come in and get them. Don't try and get them online. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about. Um, I really want to talk about privacy because that was the thing that I, I really had no idea about. This whole business with Ring, which mm -hmm. sounds like it's a bad movie, um, but apparently this is real life. Um, so, where are my notes? So, um, where are my notes? Here we go. So, yeah, I didn't know about Ring. Um, can you tell people just first of all, I guess most people probably do know about Ring because they're not such a Luddite like me, but can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, what Ring is and and sort of its its genesis and how it became part of the Amazon. Thing. Yeah, well, I, Ring was a, a startup, a Silicon Valley startup. You put a little uh, Bluetooth enabled camera on your doorbell, uh, and it's activated when someone rings the doorbell, and that video is sent to your phone. Um, so you are just aware of who's at your door, and you can see. Um, and and Amazon loved this, so they bought the startup. Um, so it, it's now owned by Amazon and they loved it because it's a way to collect data. Um, mm -hmm. you can, there are a lot of reasons why Amazon loves it. In part, it's a way to monitor their drivers. Um, the, uh, but then um, Amazon got this idea to um, create partnerships with police departments where people mm -hmm. could send video to their local police departments. And um, you know, that's basically an open pipeline. And you, the, the problems with that are numerous. Um, and you don't have to go very far to get to a really race, like uncomfortable situation in terms of race, where you have a privileged person safely ensconced in their home, sharing uh, data about a person who might be a person of color to a police department without the person of color's consent uh, to a police department with a bad track record of how they, um, they, they treat and deal with people of color. And it's just and, and a really ugly situation. And it's to the point, the, the onus for expanding these programs is on the police departments themselves. And so you have cops selling Amazon technology to the people they should be protecting and serving. You're turning uh, police departments into sales forces for the, the world's most uh, dangerous data hungry company. That, that whole thing is just really ugly. And the, and the software is not very good, is it? Certainly no, when it comes I mean, to people of color. It's, yeah, uh, well, it's, yeah. And so there's the other thing that's really scary in Amazon. They're, they're working on Ring and they're really hungrily developing the, these police department um, uh, partnerships. And then on the other hand, they have a technology called recognition with a K. Yeah. And like, it sounds like it's from a William Gibson novel. You put a K uh, in it, it makes it all yeah. fine. <laughs> and that's facial recognition technology and that's using people's data face to to identify them um and this is notoriously inaccurate for people of color it just doesn't work on darker skin and they tried it on on um people of color uh congress people and they were matched to convicts instead of senators um and so just to me it's it's pretty like i feel like to an outside observer you have doorbells with video cameras in one hand and you have facial recognition in the other hand at some point they're going to connect and you're going to have facial recognition doorbells and you're going to have a doorbell that says this face is in an fbi database we're automatically going to send this yeah. uh to the fbi um and we're like we're not even a step away from that we're a half a step away from that amazon could do it anytime they want to and there have been a couple times where where amazon like tech executives have kind of cutely referenced the fact that they might do this someday. And that's just the, the implications for civil rights and privacy are so alarming. Um, and with this massive technology, it's not a company that can be trusted to, to handle that. Um, I, I'm I tempted to like duck whenever I deliver a book to a house. With a, <laughs> or thank goodness I'm wearing a mask, you know? <laughs> I also just wanna just take a moment to recognize the rich if sad irony that the reason why Ring became 
so successful was because there was a huge uptick in the amount of packages being left on people's doorsteps. Where did yeah, those packages yeah, come right. from? <laughs> they came from Amazon. So they create the problem and then they make money from creating a solution maybe to the product. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, we've got lots and lots and lots of questions. Yeah, I like these questions. We should talk about these. Yeah, I really want to. I, I, um, could, I just want to want to ask you one more thing, though, just just okay. quickly about um, before we get to all this about government um, and about the fact that Jeff Bezos has bought the biggest house in Washington D.C. Um, can you talk a little bit? And, and I mean, it's no true. Everybody knows um, that you know Amazon pays zero tax. Um, and can, can you talk a little bit about about that and about um, sort of lobbying and 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 all of those all of the all, where, where we're going with it? I mean, I think it yeah. seems to me it's a slightly it's a slightly cheerier picture maybe than some of the other things that are going on. It is. I do. I I have. I think there have been some really important indications from the Biden administration and from Congress that we might actually get somewhere on this. So in, in reference to the question that shouldn't Amazon be under review for monopolized practices. Mm -hmm. Um, they are, and I think it'll get more intense. And that's exactly why Jeff Bezos has set his sights on DC so much. And he, the largest private re residence in Washington DC city limits is now Jeff Bezos's mansion. And it's set up for entertaining. He knows exactly where uh, the eventual undoing of his company is gonna come from. And he's working to really hard, he's working really hard to woo the people who would be responsible for this. Um, this is not the ultimate, um, fixing of the Amazon problem is not a question of consumers making different buying choices. Mm -hmm. It's a government. Um, it's a government problem with a government solution. Um, and it's uh, it, the question is not why is Amazon doing this. It's why have they been allowed to? Um, and it's the antitrust enforcement in the United States has been weak for decades, for forty years. Um, the the predominant interpretation of antitrust law has been if a company is raising prices lowering prices it can do whatever it wants um that was uh ronald reagan's favorite idea and it just stuck around and so um amazon because they can point to consumers and say we're good for consumers because we're lowering prices mm -hmm. the government is obligated to ignore everything else that's going on but i do think that's changing um and i i have a lot of hope for what's going on um both from appointees uh, promising appointees to the fact that neither party is particularly thrilled with big tech at this point we might actually have that rarest of things which is bipartisan consensus yeah it's it, it's, it, it's it's a funny thing when you find yourself agreeing with the worst constitutional law professor ever i know it's so <laughs> funny that the, the josh holly book that got canceled <laughs> yeah. was actually a book that was anti-big tech monopoly yeah i know i know oh that guy yeah <laughs> Anyway, that's probably about the only thing I'll ever agree with him on, but there you are. So, but, but that tells you just how, where we are with, with all of this. All right, let's have a look at some of these questions. Yeah. Um, uh, so Helen asks, can you talk about Amazon's cloud computing business? My understanding is that this is a significant part of their revenue. It really is. And that's what makes it impossible to boycott Amazon. Like you'll notice in the title of my book that it's not how to boycott Amazon. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure Zoom doesn't use Amazon Web Services uh, cloud hosting. Um, so we might technically be contributing to Amazon right now. And I hate that. Um, but just the, um, the size of their, their internet infrastructure business is so big that it's kind of impossible to know. Like Netflix definitely uses it. I'm pretty sure Indie Commerce from the American Booksellers Association doesn't. So <laughs> does not, does not, right. So you can safely shop Skylark Bookshop or Raven without, but it's really hard to tell um, beyond that. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's that, that, that revenue um, is, has much better, it's much more profitable than retail goods. And that's what lets them disrupt the other businesses is because they can lean on third-party seller fees. They can lean on Amazon Web Services and not make money on shipping or retail, but hook people in and get them on the flywheel with the stuff that loses money and then get them towards the more profitable revenue streams. Right. And it's also like government too, uh, you know, FBI, uh, the, the government, they're huge Amazon clients for the, the cloud computing and hosting. Okay. So Stephanie asks, uh, we support your bookstore, Alex, but question to both of you, how do we promote purchasing other things Beside books from other places than Amazon, 
all my friends find it too convenient or unaware of the total evilness of this pirate company. Can you both suggest steps to buy all products outside of Amazon, especially if not available in our town? Uh, thank you, and thank you for this special, uh, thank you for this evening. I mean, I do think that the the issue of, I mean, convenience, um, you know, you, we, we, you've talked about cost, but you know, it's, it is so easy to buy from Amazon, but as you say early on, what's easy doesn't, it doesn't make it yeah. right. Well, it's, I do, um, I want to make a, a super important point is that it's never my goal to criticize individual consumers for their, their practices. Uh, I don't know anything about their finances or their life. It's none of my business. And it makes me look really bad if I'm trying to shame people for where and how they spend money. Um, so all of my criticism tonight has been pointed directly at Amazon at the corporate level. Um, and, and, um, so it's never at people who work at Amazon. I feel tremendous solidarity for the people mm -hmm. who are, who are doing those incredibly difficult jobs. Mm -hmm. And I'm never, um, going to advocate, um, yelling at someone for shopping on Amazon. Um, and, and I think there are, again, it's that it, this isn't a, a problem that's going to be solved with individual consumer choices. And Amazon might want us to do that. Like, it's easy for them if we're all yelling at each other about where we're spending money because they can, you know, continue to do what they're doing without scrutiny. But if we organize, if we build coalitions, and if we pressure our legislators to do something about it, I think that's much more productive than getting in arguments with your brother about why he has so many Amazon boxes on his porch. I, I agree. And look, you know, we, we both know, all three of us know that... Um, there isn't a single thing in our any in, in either of our shops that can't be purchased more cheaply. Yeah, right. Um, but but what I always say is that it's our job to make people uh, not to shame them, but to make it worth their while yeah. and to make it worth spending the extra money. Yeah. Because of the experience of coming into our shop, because of uh, Kerry's brain. Uh, which I always say is better than any algorithm they'll ever create. Um, and just the experience, the knowledge, the, the, um, the, 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 the way that we curate our store and our inventory. And those are reasons f to pay more money. But we yeah. have to, we, we, we never expect, you know, we, 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 we expect to, um, to earn every single sale that we do because um, we know that people can go elsewhere. Yeah, um, yeah, and so so it's um, I, I think you're right. I, th I think it, it, it's utterly futile and pointless to try and shame well, anybody to do yeah. anything. You just have to and, make the sale. You know, despite the uh, the alarming stuff we've been talking about, I would argue it's a pretty positive book. Um, it's it's a book that doesn't ignore the harsh realities of what's going on in Amazon, but I also try really hard to make a positive case for what small businesses can do. And instead of of thinking like what your purchase isn't doing to Amazon, I always think like, I'm really helping a small business in my town. Um, and you can do that. It, it, it's like at a small business, small matters. So even if you're not buying everything uh, in town, the stuff you are buying in town makes a big difference to those businesses. Um, and, and one more point is that so many people are selling online now, um, separate from Amazon because they've been forced to by the pandemic. And like, I know both of these bookstores have gotten a ton better at shipping books on our own and, and other small businesses are selling stuff online. So if it's not in your town, like there might be someone who can ship that to you. That's not Amazon. Um, right. It might take longer. It might cost a little bit more, but we know why. Um, and uh, yeah, those, those small conscious choices, even if it's not everything and even if it's not complete, um, those, little, those little choices really do make a big difference to the small businesses. Mm -hmm. And having the information of why you're making the choices you're making. Yeah. Which yeah. is more what we're talking about here. That there, there are choices and no way we didn't know maybe what was going on before. We we know now. Yeah. So the more the more you know and the more you share that knowledge, you know, buy but but as Suzanne says, buy the book, give it to someone else, <laughs> <laughs> share the knowledge. Yeah, well, there's and the, so Jill has said. Um, you'd be also on a segment of 60 minutes with the book. Look forward to reading it. I may love it so much that everyone gets it for Christmas. So, um, yeah, it's, and, and it, there were, does, there were a lot of zines in Christmas stockings last year, <laughs> I think. But it, this is what's so useful about it is it's context is what it is. And I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's a scary book, but there is definite, you know, that there, there, it, it, you can't, respond to things unless you understand what it is you're responding to and this is why yeah. this is such a valuable book because you do such a wonderful job of making it clear um in you know i think 
actually not hyperbolic terms. I mean, the, the, the facts on their own are scary and, and you, you know, you, you, there's no need to sort of um, uh, make it more dramatic than it is because uh, it's all pretty eye-popping, but it, it's, it's such a valuable book. And I just wanted to show you, by the way, and it is interesting that you said that your book wasn't how to boycott Amazon, it was how to resist Amazon. So I, I, I just want to show you my t-shirt ah, I'm wearing today, which, um, uh, Toby uh, at um, uh, uh, Three Lives had these made, uh, and I think it was, I saw Sarah from Dragonfly Books had one yeah. on at one of those conventions, and I said, oh, where did you get that? <laughs> and she said, Toby just gives them out to people. If, if you're a bookseller and you go into a shop, uh, so the next time I was in New York, I went in and I rather sheepishly said, um, <clears throat> Can I have one of those t-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, he made he them. Gave me one. It, was, it was fantastic. So. He made them when, during the, the HQ2 search, which I write about in the book, and when they Amazon picked uh, Long Island City and Arlington, Virginia, which were basically foregone conclusions. And the whole thing was a data gathering scam about American cities. Um, but like that, I think that the, the Toby's shirts played a small part in like New York City successfully resisted Amazon at a large scale. And it's, the the them chasing that headquarters project out of New York City uh, is a, a great model. There are a couple large scale models of resisting Amazon, um, and I think that's definitely one of them. Yeah, yeah. I know Astoria Books did a lot toward that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. We didn't even talk about that about about the the the. It's not just that they don't pay any taxes, but they also effectively. It's the opposite. They we pay pride. them tax, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they get so many tax breaks because all of these these cities are so desperate to have that um, to have the business in their town. We we were in um, Seattle uh, last January, just before the the um, the COVID COVID broke, and it's just and where we were was like the the I didn't realize when we booked the hotel, but it was like the epicenter of <laughs> Amazonian whatever and. It was it was just very very strange indeed, and just everybody was driving around in their um, electric cars, and and you know it was it was kind of odd, a bit Stepford Wivesy, but anyway. <laughs> All right, well, Danny, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful yeah. uh, and enlightening conversation. We really appreciate you um, spending time with us today. Of course. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for hosting me. And thanks for being an author who publishes with big New York companies and still is willing to speak out about this. Uh, well, I, I've had, I have to had a degree of um, uh, some people have said, aren't you being a little bit hypocritical <laughs> because you're, you're, you're always complaining about Amazon and then you sell your books on Amazon. I wrote no, we don't. It's not up to you. Yeah. yeah I, said, I don't sell my books on Amazon. My publisher does. When, yeah. But it goes, but it does go back to that that initial thing that we talked about at the beginning of the thing that no publisher can afford to turn around and say uh, we're not going to do this. Now, to, yeah. to to their immense credit, <laughs> Macmillan did actually agree to take all links of Amazon off all of the materials that they put out for the Paris Hours, which I was very grateful for, and I, I sort of saw. Bob Miller sort of wince a little bit, but he did agree to do well, it. Well, this is, I, I, yeah, I mean, there need to be more authors like you. I think it's, that's, that's a great thing to do. And that's exactly what I'm thanking you for is for going to a company like that and saying, take all the Amazon links off my materials. Um, congrats. Thank you. I wish there were more like you. Well, well, listen, I hope that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to see each other in person before too much longer, but stay well, uh, uh, keep resisting. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank, thank you for this book. Really, it's it's been uh, it's been illuminating, and I'm looking forward to reading it again, but maybe not for a little while. Okay, <laughs> calm, great. Calm down first. All right, thank you, Danny. Thank Take you, thanks, thanks, Danny. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good night.